Hello, oh, and welcome back to the Systems Design series. Today, we're doing episode three, Interview Algorithm. Introduction and Disclaimer. In this video, we're gonna be going over a popular general purpose algorithm for solving systems design questions. I wanna give you a disclaimer and tell you that design rounds are extremely subjective and you may choose to approach them in a different way or apply the algorithm in a slightly different order. That's fine. Please do whatever works best for you. Whatever you feel gives you the best uh, chance of success is the best approach. There's no real one best way. This is just the most common template for success that a lot of candidates use. This video might also touch on some topics which we haven't covered yet in the series. So if you don't understand certain things, don't worry, we're gonna cover it eventually down the line. All right, we're gonna be talking about the README algorithm. And for this exercise, we're gonna be assuming that our interviewer has asked us to design Instagram. Okay, README starts with R, requirements. The first and most important part of any systems design interview is the requirements gathering stage. This part can be broken down into two sections. The functional requirements, what should our system literally be able to do? In our Instagram example, it could be things like upload or view photos and videos, follow other users, and generate and display a news feed with the content from the people you follow. We also have the non-functional requirements, which are the technical characteristics about our system. For example, you know, our system should be highly reliable, right? Photos and videos that you upload to Instagram, they should never be lost once they've been uploaded. We can also say that 200 milliseconds is an acceptable latency for generating and delivering a newsfeed. Obviously, it's a bad user experience. If you have to wait 10 seconds just to see your photos, you're probably going to close the app. And availability over consistency. If a user doesn't see an upload from a follower immediately, it's not a big deal. Okay, so we saw that you need to gather the functional and the non-functional requirements for the system. And these are going to be question specific, but typically, like I said, functional is always the what. What actions do we need the system to perform? And the non-functional is the how. And depending on the requirements given to you by the interviewer, this is going to depend, uh, determine how you end up designing the components in your system. In the requirements part, you also want to ask questions about the traffic flowing in and out of your system. How many total users can we assume? How many of these are daily active? How much data is flowing in and out of our system? For the Instagram example, how many photos or videos are going to be uploaded every day? If the data is coming into your system, what's the average size per piece of data? For Instagram, our interviewer will tell us something like, assume a photo is on average 200 kilobytes and a video is 2 megabytes. Asking these questions is crucial because it's gonna affect your design decisions when you're choosing a database system and determining how to store the data. Okay, E, back of the envelope estimations. Once you have gather, gathered a satisfactory amount of information about the requirements of your system, you now need to perform some estimation of the amount of traffic you'll be dealing with. Typically, this looks like calculating requests per second, the data storage requirements for a day, one year and 10 years worth of data, bandwidth estimations per second. Let's look at an example. So remember that we're working with an Instagram example, and let's assume that we have 500 million users with 1 million of those being active on any given day. We're gonna have 1 million new photos per day, and a photo is gonna be on average 200 kilobytes in size, and a news feed for a user is gonna show 50 photos on average. So if we have 1 million daily users and there are 8, uh, 86,400 seconds in a day, this works out to be roughly 12 requests per second. If we have 1 million photos per day and each photo is 200 kilobytes, that equates to about 200 gigabytes a day we need to store, which is about 73 terabytes per year or 730 terabytes over 10 years. If we need to show 50 photos in a timeline and each photo is 200 kilobytes and we're getting about 12 requests per second, then we should expect about 120 megabytes per second egress, so leaving our system and going to the user at any second. Okay, here's some tips and tricks to do these back of the envelope calculations. And don't get me wrong, they're really annoying 
and you likely won't be allowed to use a calculator here. So you need to be able to do this in your head quickly. So you need to practice this because it doesn't come naturally, or at least it didn't come naturally for me. And here's some important numbers that you need to know. One day is gonna be 86,400 seconds. One kilobyte is gonna be 1,000 bytes, which is 10 to the third bytes. One megabyte is 1 million bytes. One gigabyte, 1 billion bytes. One terabyte, 1 trillion bytes. So your calculations don't have to be perfect here. They can be off a little bit as long as the mag magnitude is correct i.e. if you say it's 12 requests per second when it's really 11.78 that's totally fine what's not fine is saying that you expect 100 megabytes per day when actually you expect 100 gigabytes per day right that's a huge difference and your interviewer is probably gonna be like wait a minute you've messed this up and they might ding you for that so my tip for byte level calculations is always to work in bytes because you can write them as exponents and division by exponents is really easy so let's do a little bit of a math review and try to remember some of the algebra that we learned in school. When dealing with exponents whose base is the same, so for example, two to the fourth and two to the fifth, they both have a base of two. And if you multiply those two values, you can simply add the powers. Two to the fourth times two to the fifth is two to the ninth, which is 512, right? We add the five and the four and we keep the base the same. So it's two to the ninth. And if you're dividing the values, you can subtract the powers. So two to the fifth divided by two to the fourth is gonna be equal to five minus four, which is one. So two to the one, which is just two. And we can use this trick when doing our back of the envelope calculations uh, by putting everything into a base 10 and then simply adding or subtracting the exponents. And this makes our life much easier. All you have to do is convert your initial values to base 10 and then figure out the final answer and then convert that back to base, uh, you know, to whatever unit seems the most reasonable, right? You don't want to just say, oh, we expect 700 billion bytes um, per day. You generally want to bring that to like whatever the closest uh, full thing. So you, you know, you put that in like gigabytes, terabytes. You don't want to just say bytes because then we'll be like, can you just translate that? Um, so yeah, I find that much easier than looking uh, in terms of like megabytes and gigabytes and then trying to like divide megabytes by gigabytes. Like it's just a pain in the ass. And I find it much easier to just do it all in bytes and then convert back at the very end. Okay, so let's look at an example. So remember that in our system, we had 1 million new photo uploads per day, and there was 200 kilobytes per photo. How many megabytes per second are gonna be coming into our system? Well, 1 million is 10 to the sixth. 200 kilobytes is gonna be 200 times a kilobyte, which is 1,000 bytes. So this is two times 10 to the fifth, right? Because we can take the two, uh, zeros from the 200, add them to the three zeros of the uh, 1000 bytes, and then we get 10 to the fifth um, bytes, right? So one day is going to be 86,400 seconds, which is 0 0.86 times 10 to the fifth. 10 to the fifth is 100,000. So it makes sense that 0 0.86 times 100,000 is going to be 86,000. Obviously, we're cutting out the four here. But again, these calculations don't have to be exact. So let's do it with exponents. So we have 10 to the sixth photos times two times 10 to the fifth bytes per photo divided by 0 0.86 times 10 to the fifth. So as you can see, the two 10 to the fifths will cancel each other out, which means that we're just left with two times 10 to the sixth divided by 0 0.86, which is approximately 2.5 times 10 to the sixth bytes per second. And remember 10 to the sixth bytes is going to be one megabyte. So we have 2.5 megabytes per second coming into our system. These are the sort of calculations you're gonna have to be able to do. So please get comfortable with doing these things because you don't wanna waste time in the interview messing around with your math. And you know, you can't use Google for this. You can't use a calculator. And I mean, obviously most calculators don't even have like a megabyte to gigabyte translation. So you're gonna need to be able to do this. Please don't underestimate this because it is quite tricky. And if you waste time on this, well, you know, that sucks for you because you're gonna have less time for your actual design and it could mean passing or failing. So do take this part seriously. Okay, A, APIs. Now that you've defined the scale of the system with your back of the envelope estimations, you can focus on the APIs for your system. Here's where you wanna define the endpoints and their parameters that are gonna power your system. Obviously not an uh, extensive list, 
there's probably tons of APIs that are gonna go into your system, but just talk about the most important ones. So for our Instagram example, we're gonna have a post photo endpoint, which is going to take a user ID, the photo data, maybe a caption, its location, and that's going to basically send it off to our system to basically store and you know we'll post that photo. We can follow a user, so we'll pass in the user ID of user one and user two, and we'll add some sort of relationship in our database that reflects that user one is following user two. We can like a piece of content, so we'll have a user ID that initiated the like, and then the content ID um, of that piece of content. We could have a get newsfeed API, which for a given user, and then we wanna fetch the newsfeed from a certain time, because likely we'll already have a newsfeed on the device that we've already cached. So instead of fetching everything, we can just get from the last time we fetched. That way we don't have to just fetch everything and then a max items to fetch. Maybe you're scrolling it on um, you know, a modern device where you can actually get more items so you can fetch more. But if you're, you know, say you're in a third world country where data is really expensive, maybe you only want to fetch five or 10 items at a time. Whereas, you know, say you're somewhere uh, in a developed country, you can fetch like 100 and it's not going to be an issue because data is really cheap. Okay, D, design, high level design. Once you've defined the APIs, you can then start laying out the core components of your system. You don't want to go into too much detail yet, you're just laying out the components of your system. You're going to be elaborating on them soon. So you can talk about things like load balancers, your application layer, the database, what blob storage you might use, how you might integrate caching and CDNs. And you're going to want to chart the flow of data between the components in your system and how a request is going to flow from the client initiating it through your system and ultimately how it's going to be returned back to the user. So let's look at an example. So obviously here we have our clients on the left and they're going to be sending um, you know, requests to our server. But obviously we want to have a load balancer here as to not overload our server. So they're going to go to the load balancer which is gonna delegate them to our application server, which is gonna handle all the requests. That application server is gonna to go to the database to fetch um, you know, whatever metadata it needs. And then we'll have some separate photo storage um, to actually store the photos and videos because obviously you can't store photos and videos in MySQL. You're gonna need some sort of other uh, solution for that. So this is like a very high level design. Obviously I didn't go into too much detail. This is just the rough design we're gonna elaborate later on. Okay, M memory design, AKA how you're gonna be setting up your database. So once you have a high level design implemented, you can then do a bit of a deep dive into how you wanna set up your database. Remember that you're building a highly scalable system. So you likely need to discuss how to set up your indices and partitions slash shards, uh, we'll do the same thing, uh, to efficiently store your data as it definitely won't fit on a single database server. Remember to always tie this back to the requirements you scoped out at the beginning of the interview. For example, we said that 200 milliseconds is the maximum latency for timeline generation. This means that we have to be able to fetch all of the photos from a user's followers very quickly. So our database needs to set up to be set up in a way that facilitates this. And there's so much to talk about when it comes to setting up your database, though we won't do it here because the video would get too long and we'll have a dedicated section just for partitioning. What's important to remember is to always keep in mind the requirements of the system and use those to justify your decision. If a certain operation has been identified as critical for your system, your database design should optimize for that. E, extend your design. At this stage, you've scoped out the requirements, you've done the estimation calculations, you've talked about APIs, you drew a high level design, and you talked about your database design. Now it's time to actually make your uh, system scalable. All right, take that diagram you drew and make it fault tolerant and highly scalable. This means introducing clusters of servers to eliminate single points of failure, adding replication mechanisms to the database and breaking apart your application layer monolith into microservices and so much more. We want to make our system resilient to issues and make sure it can handle going from a simple thousand users use case to potentially billions of users and the data they're gonna be creating. And the key to success here is always to discuss trade-offs. As I've stated many times in this videos, the system design interviews are highly subjective and there's no one best answer. Every decision you make usually has a trade-off between it and another choice. It's your job to proactively, i.e. without the interviewer asking you to, explain your choice for each of the choices you make. Tie everything back to the requirements of the system you scoped out. 
This is how decisions are made in the real world. You have a problem to solve, people come up with multiple approaches, and you decide what makes the most sense given the constraints of what you have to work with. Let's think in trade-offs and go over an example. Let's say you've been asked to hammer some nails into a wall. What are some of your options? Well, you could use your hand and slam your hand into the nail and try to get it into the wood. It's going to be extremely painful and probably not the best tool for the job. You could use a screwdriver and maybe whack it with the fat end of the screwdriver and it might go in there, but it's slightly better than your hand. It'd probably be less painful, but it's still not the best tool for the job. You could use a hammer, which is highly effective and it's going to nail those nails perfectly. But if you have a lot of nails to get in, it might get tedious to do so. So there is a trade-off there. This is one of the best tools. It's really cheap. You can pretty much give this to anyone and they're gonna hammer those nails. But if you have a ton of nails you need to do, then it's not really efficient. And then we have something like a nail gun. Nail gun, you press a button, nail. Press a button, nail. So if you have a ton of nails you need to put in, well, use a nail gun because it's gonna be, just squeeze the trigger and it's going to shoot the nails. But they're also really expensive. They're kind of dangerous. You can potentially kill someone. Um, you know, there's probably other issues. If it breaks, how do you fix it? Whereas a hammer is really simple. So as you can see, there's a trade-off to each approach. And like I said, there's no real one best answer, though there are usually terrible answers that you want, you'd want you never want to talk about, right? You'd never use your hand to hammer in nails. Similarly, there's just certain things you don't do in a design interview because it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, you literally could do that, but why? It's like in a leak code interview, you're not gonna write uh, four nested for loops and have a big O of n to the fourth solution when you can do it in one pass with, you know, like a dictionary and have it be super optimized, right? Like just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So the trade-off really comes between two solutions that actually make sense. And in our example, this is the hammer and the nail gun. So it seems like there's so much we need to do. Like leak code, system design interviews can seem really intimidating at first. There's so many moving parts and you need to get through a lot of discussion very quickly. Like in leak code, Companies are generally pretty lazy and tend to ask the same questions over and over again. The list of questions is much smaller than the pool of leak code questions floating out there, so it's much easier to study and prep for because you have to learn less overall. Questions generally follow the same pattern and can be solved with a readme approach, although obviously some variations may be present depending on what your interviewer wants to talk about. So thank you so much for watching. That concludes the algorithm to solve any design question. Let's recap. You have R for requirements, E for estimation calculations, A for APIs, D for high level design, M for memory, AKA database design, and E for expand your solution and make it scale. So from here on out, we're gonna be doing a deep dive into the individual components you need to know when preparing for a design interview. These are gonna be high level concepts like partitioning, replication, etc and also deep dives into technologies like when should you use MySQL versus NoSQL or messaging queues and any other tech you might need to use to design your system. So that's the video. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully you found it informative. If you did, please leave a like and a comment on the video. It really helps me with the YouTube algorithm. I wanna reach as many people as I can with my content. So you helping me out with the algorithm is gonna help me do that. Otherwise, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the next video and also any future leak code question videos I might make. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video and have a great rest of your day.